special event, and we're going to get started here. Uh, we've got a uh, special kind of lineup for you tonight to celebrate Indigenous resurgence and healing in the South Pacific and Canada. And uh, we have several films that we're going to feature, and we'll talk about, uh, and we also have a, a special keynote. So my name is Jeff Corntassel. I'm from Cherokee Nation. I'm also an associate director of CIRCLE, the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement, and uh, really celebrating our long-term partnership with Pacific People's Partnership tonight and uh, some of the work that we've done together and will continue to do. Wanted to start us off in a good way uh, tonight by bringing up Barb Holm, uh, an elder uh, who's from the Métis Nation, and really to start us off uh, with some words of welcome. And uh, so please welcome Barb. What up, Barb? I'll do the handoff. Thank you very much, Jeff. Hopefully this works. My name is Barb Hume, and I am Métis, and I'm originally from Selkirk, Manitoba. I've been a visitor on these territories for the last 30 years. And as a visitor to these territories, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the lands of the Lekwungen people, on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and acknowledge the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples' traditional relationship with the lands that continue to this day. I am pleased to welcome you into these beautiful lands and into this warm and comforting space. I'm aware that 2021 is the 14th year of the One Wave Gathering and that sharing has and is taking place throughout this month of September. 2020 and 2021 have been more than challenging for all peoples as a result of the pandemic. And I commend all for this year's themes of healing and resurgence. I believe the sharing of stories in our many cultural ways will demonstrate our resilience and our determination to move forward in a healthy way. Today is the International World Day of Peace, and I hope that each of us, in our own way, and through projects such as this, help each other, as was described in the write-up, to build a more equitable future for us all. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to all you have to share this evening and into our futures. Thank you. token of appreciation from all of us for taking the time out tonight to be with us. So thank you. All right. So as Barb mentioned, uh, thank you again, Barb. Uh, this is the International Day of Peace and it's a special day for us to honor as I was preparing for today. I was thinking of the Cherokee notion of peace. Uh, we have a word that's tohi, which means being still, uh, but it also means being balanced. And so we think of peace in a much deeper way than just the absence of conflict or the absence of war. We think of it as a, as a state of mind, right? Uh, and for us, you know, that peaceful relation means living according to the pace of nature. And so I, I think the stories that are going to be shared tonight are part of that. Uh, the stories teach us, the stories shape us, the, short, the stories really inform who we are as Indigenous people. So I'm looking forward to, to watching these films tonight. And uh, we do have uh, the, drum, the drum group Answer that's going to join us a little bit later. But I think for now I'm going to hand it off to, to April and Mua, so the director of Pacific People's Partnership, and Mua, who's the president and uh, so honored to have you both here and uh, taking part in this. So, what do? Malo sefua, fatalo fatu le swafuman malo. Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Aveye nei teme fafei lo ia tu ia te hotu uma lava oe lo o apenao na mo o mail nei fa salonga ia te tono lo o e soifua o ia soifua langi ma ia te hotu uma lava ia fa pena fo nei tu ia o te fia te utala e mo mua fo i on ave le fa malo fa aftai fo i tu fine nei tu fo i mo le le fafei lo ina ia le ngata fo i lea doctor chef Fafai fo i mo le nei te mi mo le fafai lo ingo ma tou i o le o si a si na fafala tala tatu a vei amo sui o le Pacific People Partnership e fatu ai si fafai te le lava ya te o tou uma I just want to take a few words just to first of all acknowledge this place the acknowledge the territory the traditional territory of the Lukwani people we are very grateful to be here. On their territory, uh, as the organization of the Pacific People Organization, we have the privilege over the years to work with many of the people here in the university, including Dr. Chef. So we're so grateful for welcoming us here. And today, uh, very significant. Um, the world today, we celebrate the word of peace, or the world uh, is a peace uh, in our language. We call it Asole File Mu. Ole file mu de la lang, eser taua. You know, so important to for many South Pacific small islands. When we talk about the file mu, for the peace, it's important to our people. We're not big country, but we always strive to find way to at peace with each other, and with nature, and around the world. So we are, as Pacific people, we are constantly looking for a way to connect. And that just sort of lead me to the, the connection between uh, the one wave gathering and just being here and acknowledging the, the world peace. Um, in our language, in my language of Samoan, uh, one wave, it's like a tasilengalu, to fatas. Tasilengalu bolelalang, which means it's a one wave as we gather together. So if you look at you from a, a, someone that I grew up in the ocean, I grew up in a, right close to my home was right beside the beach, and uh, I can hear uh, in the morning waking up, uh, going up in the day, you can see this, the, the, the wave comes and go. Uh, but there are a time when uh, there was a big wave that come together. Many, most of us, little ones back in then, we just jump in and surf. But there was something significant about big wave, because the wave actually gathering everybody, and it just bring forth. Everything is on the shore, and everything will gathering. The wave will bring it in or take it out. And to me, uh, this is a significant part of that. No matter where you are, uh, when we talk about one wave gathering is a wave of everyone gathered together and acknowledge. And we need to always acknowledge world peace. And I just wanted to thank you for you for listening up and tuning to the uh, live this afternoon. And we are so grateful for as a, as a president of the Pacific Peel Partnership, we are so grateful that you are tuning in and you are here with us and celebrate this and looking forward to what what more to come tonight so we're just gonna to stand with you and uh, remember great thing uh, within this organization with those of the people that walk with us and journey with us so faftai lava from anwil etua haich gasiem Those. <laughs> this won't be as foggy now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mua. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Barb. It's a real pleasure to be here with everybody here today and to mark International Day of Peace. It's such an important day and a day that we need to kind of keep in our hearts, you know, um, every day to remember, especially during these times of great division and hardship for so many people. So I, I know that for me that this holds a really big part of my heart. 
but so do youth, because I see youth as the promise of our future. And this program today is about celebrating and honoring youth. So I'm really grateful to um, all of the youth that have been participating in our programs, which began last year around looking at resilience and um, looking at those stories, those important stories that have those markers, that carry those legends, that also tell us what we need to do today in difficult times. There we go, excuse me. So, um, Mu has given a little bit of background on our organization. We've been in uh, Victoria on the Kwangan um, speaking people's territories for over 45 years. And what we've been doing over those 45 years is linking peoples north south for knowledge sharing, for community building, kinship, as we deal with some of the challenging issues facing us today, um, including like generations of colonization. I know that Sid over here was telling me about how there was five different um, types of colonization that happened in her country in Palau. And it's just hearing these stories and, and having the ability to be in solidarity with others that have faced similar challenges, whether it's the extraction industries or look, dealing with COVID within our communities. Um, there's a lot of work to do and there's so much more we can do when we work together. And that's what PPP does, is we create opportunities for partnering, for learning together, for being in solidarity, for supporting each other when we need it. And I'm very proud of our organization and its long history. We started in the days of the nuclear testing and still to this day, people that are from those regions are feeling the effects of those tests. But at least as a global community, we were able to stand and to stop those tests. But there's so much work to do. Um, again, we're here celebrating the youth, and we're also acknowledging resilience, and we're marking this day of peace. And for over 35 years, our organization has been involved in one of the world's most hidden uh, genocides, and that is what's happening in West Papua. The indigenous West Papuan people have been annexed in their own territories um, by a foreign government and living under colonization um, for four decades. Um, we have a speaker with us, a young leader, a young activist who is going to be speaking to you shortly. And um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to him. And so Nathan Rue is a Papua New Guinean and a Pakea. Uh, European, a doctoral candidate in sociology at the University of Auckland. He's raised in Aotearoa. Nathan is committed anti-colonial activist and educator who works to bring attention to and challenge the ongoing genocide of West Papuans under Indonesian oppression and occupation. His research focuses on indigenous philosophies of water across Oceania and their necessity in navigating the coming consequences of climate change. So, is Nathan good to go? I come in third. Is that all, all good? Hi, can you try um, speaking, please? Hey, yeah, is that is that coming through? No? Okay, yeah, we're all good? Good to go? Yes, you're good to go. Cool. All right, sweet. Hi. Kia ora. Um, uh, I'm Nate. Uh, I, I, as is mentioned, um, I'm from Papua New Guinea, uh, particularly from the village uh, Yokia uh, in the Kerema region of Gulf Province, uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, I'm a, a doctoral candidate at the University of Auckland. I've been in New Zealand, Aotearoa, uh, most of my life um, and have been kind of engaged and involved in, in a range of um, decolonial and anti-colonial uh, and re-indigenization uh, movements um, here. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I was kind of invited here to talk a little bit about uh, the West Papuan context um, and, and the struggle that's, that's been kind of ongoing 
um, there. And so, yeah, I'm uh, not super certain about everyone's kind of general um, uh, background in terms of uh, the situation, but the the West the ongoing West Papuan genocide um, has been happening since the essentially the, the late kind of 1960s um, under Indonesian uh, rule. It's a really kind of complex situation as to how that kind of unfolded and how it became Indonesian um, uh, under Indonesian control, and, and it has a long history that's kind of grounded in. Uh, uh, I guess a, a similar document which we we've all kind of encountered as indigenous peoples, uh, the doctrine of discovery, um, and those kind of uh, I guess uh, the the kind of legal justifications that were were adopted by colonial nations um, to 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 try and uh, go into our territories and claim them, and so. Um, you know, it's not often acknowledged, but the Dutch East India Company was was the main proponent for for colonization um, of West Papua in in the first place in, in the early 1600s, um, and so, you know, we, we talk about the kind of ongoing genocide that's happening today, but it's part of this kind of longer, more broad history of colonization and the kind of uh, brutal and violent consequences that that I'm you know we're, we're all aware of, of of the colonial process and, and how it's unfolded um, so originally kind of under Dutch control um, and and that was uh, kind of reaffirmed in the 1800s uh, and then yeah through through the the kind of processes of supposed decolonization it was it was weaponized language of decolonization which essentially allowed the the indonesian um people and government to to claim west papua as one of their territories i mean that's kind of one of the overarching reasons but we also need to be really aware um and and uh, you know the the mentioning of extractive resources uh, <laughs> The, the genocide in West Papua is, is fundamentally a genocide based on the fact that uh, the, it's immensely valuable, it's immensely profitable um, for, for the genocide and for the, the suppression of West Papuans to occur. Um, and and this, is, this is kind of really important because often when we talk about what's happened and what's unfolding in West Papua, so I mean, uh, just last week, um, we got video footage uh, sent out from uh, villagers um, being um, basically chased out of their territories by uh, Indonesian militants as they kind of just opened fire into the bush and, and uh, our siblings, our Wontoks were forced to flee. Um, there's been uh, widespread internet shutdowns as part of, uh, in response to protests um uh since uh i think about 1968 there's been a, at least an acknowledged or or or, or kind of generally uh accepted 500,000 west papuans um killed at the hands of indonesian forces um and and this is ongoing you know this this is that i mean that's the kind of generic number. We see the deaths taking place every every week, um, despite the attempts to, to kind of block um, media and all that, there, there's still information getting out um, about the, the, the context and and it's horrific. It's, yeah, sorry, it's, it's tough. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, really, really messed up ways in which Indonesia is kind of um, utilizing, you know, language around indigenous peoples and stuff to, to, to justify their, their colonization uh, of, of West Papua. And that's, that started back in the 60s and has continued into today. Um, more recently, the kind of resistance has, has taken the form in response to uh, an attempt by the Indonesian um, government to shift the relationship they, they they're recognizing that um west papuans are, are upset and so they tried to kind of manipulate the situation a little bit by by uh offering a vote on special autonomy um for the west papuans and that was uh put through i think last year um 
they started the process of, of putting through these kind of discussions and, and that's been overwhelmingly rejected by the West Papuan people. It's, it's not um, something that people are in support of and in kind of response to this, there's been protests and, and an escalation of violence, which is, has continued into the kind of more recent um, past couple of months. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating being here in Aotearoa and, and, and then COVID and, and all these things kind of happening and not being able to really get out there and, and present. So I, I wanna thank the organizers for giving me uh, the opportunity to just uh, to speak about this because um, you know, even even some of the uh, indigenous uh, folks who are in parliament and in government today, uh, the Nayamahuda, for example, um, they're unwilling to to condemn Indonesia and, and not willing to to really, um, you know, they're echoing the language of special autonomy as if this is something the West Papuans uh, are are fighting for or wanting and. It's, it's only and will only ever be freedom for West Papua. I think that's, you know, um, the, there is no kind of compromise in that respect. And I guess um, in terms of where West Papuan resistance is, is taking place then against this kind of uh, ongoing brutality, um, uh, there's, there's obviously the, the kind of uh, explicit um, militant response that is taking place in terms of uh, dealing with the kind of um, heightened uh, militarization of Indonesia in, in that territory. Um, but there's also resistance taking place around the world in really kind of amazing ways. And so uh, one of those leaders, um, Benny Winder, obviously is, is, is an important kind of figure in that. And the United Liberation Movement for West Papua, the ULMWP, um, they've kind of in a, in a really um, brilliant step have just announced their interim parliament for West Papua and, and announced um, Benny Wenda as the interim president, um, which is, I think, in, in, in my kind of mind, a brilliant um, a step to just start with recognizing the, the illegitimacy of the kind of Indonesian um, claim to West Papua in that respect. Um, Obviously, it's being met with resistance, and and uh, you know it, it, we're still waiting for for countries around the world to start, you know, perhaps recognizing um, this interim presidency and this interim parliament. Um, but those are some of the kind of moves that are taking place today, which I think are are really important in terms of challenging on a kind of geopolitical scale. Um, the 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 ongoing uh, genocide in West Papua. Um, I think it's also, yes, I did mention the kind of extractive context, and I think that's important to focus on because that is one of the, the major obstacles um, that uh, lies before us in terms of, um, you know, West Papua has, uh, I think the second biggest or one of the biggest gold mines in, in the world, um, as well as I think the biggest copper mine in the world, which, you know, poses some some kind of uh, interesting questions in terms of whose financial interests are are allowing this genocide to take place. And um, you know, we, we can point out you know the big players, the 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 Americans and and even the Dutch are benefiting from it still. Um, there's this kind of ongoing struggle against capital and the interest of capital there that need to be kind of um brought out in terms of yeah just not necessarily uh i mean it just poses the biggest uh, 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 obstacle for us in terms of um as indigenous peoples wanting to protect our environment and stop these kind of extractive systems um and that's tied with our sovereignty and and as as a result our our attempts for sovereignty are, are constantly overlooked um yeah, I think there's there's definitely hope, and the the most amazing thing is is just the the increased discussion that's been happening around West Papua, the the making aware of it and um, spreading it. You know, they the I, I the fact that 
Indonesia is constantly trying to stop the media coverage and constantly trying to stop us from talking about West Papua and constantly trying to stop us from sharing shows us that they're afraid of, of people's kind of understanding and knowledge of that context and situation. So again, I just really want to thank the organizers for, for allowing us to come and just share the story, share the struggle. Um, I just, uh, when the brother was talking about the, uh, the one wave, I was also kind of reminded about uh, a, a term in pigeon that we have one sawara, the one saltwater, which is the, the kind of one saltwater, which brings us all together, collectivizes us in our struggle. And I think, you know, if we're looking at the context of West Papua and its position in terms of the broader history of colonization, it's it's very much um, history that I, I think we're all familiar with um, and a history which has kind of uh, left us in a, in a really, really kind of horrific position. Uh, I think that's me. Thank you very much, Nathan, for that uh, really important overview of the reality of what's happening in West Papua and for keeping the fight alive. Our organization worked, uh, like I said, in the advocacy around this issue for over three decades. Um, but we were very fortunate in um, 2009 to have a five-year program funded in the country by the Canadian government, and we're thrilled to see that that um, took place. We were able to do some really good work with health organizations, legal aid organizations, as well as with organizations fighting for the environmental rights and the land rights of the um, indigenous West Papuan peoples. So um, we just say to our brothers and sisters there that we're thinking of you and that we also share that vision of Papua land of peace. Um, right now, I just want to start by introducing some of the stories of resilience um, members and just maybe give a quick little background as to what this program was all about. Um, in, I guess at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when we realized how serious this was going to be, I think we had just settled into it maybe a couple months last year. And um, I had a, a young group of, of women that wanted to come and talk to me. And uh, these young Indigenous women were from um, Sartlip territory as well as Sauk Nation territory. And they came to the office and we sat together and they talked about, you know, about surviving this time of this COVID and climate change and all the convergence of everything coming together. And, um, you know, how, how would people, their question was, how would people survive? How do people survive? And I mean, you know, that's a big question and there's a lot to consider in that. And they wanted to do an investigation. They wanted to understand it. They wanted to go and interview elders and talk to people about resilience, about how it is that they are still here. What, you know, what contributed to that? And uh, it was such an inspiring meeting for me. And we did try to set up some meetings, but as you know, with the lockdowns, we just, we couldn't do that and still be safe at that time. There was too many unknowns. Um, but that, those women, those young women, inspired um, a project that uh, we were thrilled to do at our last One Wave, which was to assemble young people, some of which are still here participating today, um, as part of a cohort to explore what resilience means to them, and also to offer training in, in filmmaking and access to elders and to supports and places to go and to, you know, just resources so that they could explore what resilience means to them and to share their stories in their own way without having a lot of pressure around it. And I'm thrilled to say that the cohort grew to be about seven or eight youth that contributed in different ways. And you're going to be seeing some of the films of some of these youth today. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that everybody contributed in different ways. So there's also publications that are coming out fairly shortly that we look for sharing with, with you all as well. And um, others had other gifts in performing arts. So we've been able to embrace those different voices in different ways and contribute um, and, and help to share and create a platform for those really important stories. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Tana and uh, Sid up here um, just to maybe speak a little bit to 
what um, Stories of Resilience means to you, and then we'll introduce some of the films that we're going to showcase tonight. So, Tana, I'm totally putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. You just arrived, but I'm just thrilled to see you. And just um, a housekeeping thing, we're going to put this on when you talk, and um, so maybe one at a time, just so that the people that are live streaming can see and hear us. Okay. Who would like to go first? Tana, do you want to go first? You can take your um, mask off when you're talking, if you're comfortable. You don't have to, though. Okay. I think maybe you. Yeah. 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 And I finished it, but I'm very homesick. But um, I like to say that um, the stories of resilience like, taught me how to use technology and communicate in order to do storytelling. And um, storytelling is a big part of Palau. And just to share that the word for Palau for peace is Buddha. And every time I hear a story about peace, it's always women in my country who are showing peace, so I hope to share those stories with you. Thank you. Uklasish, the five nook, his subjects, a house it, you qua heshkuyet. My name is Tata Thomas. I come from Ahauzit and Heshkwit of the Nuchanal Nations. Um, yeah, I guess it was a couple years ago I worked with Pacific Peoples Partnership and I did a summer, summer internship with them. And we got together, a group of ladies, and we sat around the table and just shared the importance of. Um, creating a platform for our youth to speak on. And we talked about the intergenerational trauma that needs to be focused on as well. Like lots of sectors need to be more trauma informed. And so it was really beautiful to create a platform through media um, that was trauma informed and to work alongside several indigenous youth and throughout this experience and this project I have learned a lot about respectful storytelling and creating that space for our elders and our youth and our community members to find their own voice and um, like put respectful boundaries around it too, you know, what is sacred and what stays in our communities and what audience we're doing a film for. And so I learned a lot and I'm really thankful to be a part of this project. So thank you. Chu. <laughs> So our first video that's going to be played is by Benjamin Mulchanuk, who is a Métis and Cree student currently living in Victoria, BC. Having grown up in Vancouver Island, Benjamin has seen this play of Indigenous resilience throughout his life. From the idle No More demonstrations to growing up around the local Indigenous filmmaking scene, Benjamin continues to search for ways to share cultures and realize positive change. As a biology and philosophy student at Concordia University of Montreal, Ben is hoping to use scientific, academ academic, and writing knowledge to contribute to indigenous causes, specifically with respect to the ever-increasing threat of climate change. Ben spends his other time reading, hiking, watching films, and going for 
brands. So please enjoy the video by Benjamin. Thank you, guys. Nathan, sorry, Benjamin, you mind uh, speaking to see if we can hear you and see you? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. Am I audible right now? I'm assuming I'm good to go? Yes, you're good to go. Thank oh, you. perfect. OK, awesome. Well, uh, thank you, Sid, for that introduction and, um, and April for, for throwing this all together and making this, this day happen. Um, I thought that I was, I was, my introduction was covered pretty well. Um, I, I did this short film. Uh, as part of the Stories of Resilience project, which um, I found out about just briefly as I was back in Victoria for Christmas. Um, right now I'm in Montreal, otherwise I would absolutely be here. But uh, I heard about it and I, I knew that I needed to apply right away, knowing that we I, I could have this opportunity to have this huge, uh, vast amount of, of knowledge and resources, especially from April and, and Peter Bolt, um, who was coordinating a lot of uh, a lot of the project? So, finally, being able to to have all these resources and 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 learn just such a great deal in such a short amount of time um, on on photography, on filmmaking, on writing, and just kind of um, and dip my and dip my toes into all these different mediums as a way of showing resilience uh, and, and exploring it further and what it means to to different people of various ages from youth to elders and, and really just see how vastly different resilience can be, whether it's um, uh, an overtly political thing or uh, in the form of activism or, or strive for political change, or even in more minor things like just getting through uh, the pandemic, for example, uh, if you are part of a marginalized group, um, so to be able to explore that and have so many meaningful discussions in, in such a short time was fantastic. Um, and this, this little short clip was just one of those interviews that I did with Mary, who I'm not sure if, if she's in the audience. If she is, hi, Mary. Uh, thanks for letting me interview you. I really just, she walked in one day to the office as I was doing other work and I thought, oh, there's, Mary, come here, I'm gonna interview you really quickly. And, and she was fantastic about it. So. Uh, I had a really fun time, uh, and it, it was really meaningful, the, the couple of months that I was able to spend uh, meeting so many great people, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much. Give me, then, a summary, a brief summary of who you are. Who is Mary? <laughs> who am I? Um, I'm from the Kwaku nation. My mother is Kwaku, and my dad, sorry, is it okay? yeah. My mom is Kwaku, and my dad is Musko Zabdino, which is in Kinkapunlet. And for Rupert, 
So they're both located on North Island. And um, I have a huge family. I have about a billion cousins, a billion aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters that yeah, have um, oh, are huge on soccer. Family's huge on soccer. If you ask any, it'll be in my interview too. My uncle talks about soccer, and that's pretty, pretty much all he talks about. Yeah. Family and soccer, I mean, I mean, drive. Nice, thank you. Good answer. Okay. Next question uh, Can you describe to me what you are doing right now? So, I'm editing my interview that I did with a relative. Um, so, I'm just cutting and deleting um, footage that isn't needed, if there's long pauses or if you fumbled, and it'll be transitioned into a smoother video. And now, what I'm doing is placing them in the right spot of the time frame. And who is that? Who is the relative? Uh, Alex Nelson. He's my great uncle. The more than that, honestly. Yeah. So we're the project I'm working on is Stars of Resilience, and that's what we've been working on for two and a half months now. Um, so we get to pick a person to interview, and that's how we came about our project. Is we all came together to do a docu series and interviewing people to, sh to tell their story and what the resilience came from it. So what I did was, um, my uncle Alex, my great uncle Alex went to residential school and he has been interviewed for years and he's comfortable talking about it. So at the end of the interview, he always talks about the resilience of it, of the tragedy and the trauma that came about it in the past, and then became intergenerational. So I'm third generation from residential school, and I'm still, you know, it impacts me. Um, yeah, so he over, I don't want to say overcame it, but he is comfortable with it now to talk about the resilience of it and how strong he became the partnership. Yeah, and honestly, I think it's it's important to some people like yes, they overcame it. They still want to talk about it. Yeah. yeah so to, why do you think it's important to share these stories, and do you think it's especially true now? I think it's important to share these stories because you're helping the youth and you're helping the next generation come after you, so that they know that they're not alone and they're not uncomfortable with who they are, they're proud to be who they are. So I think it's really important to tell your story of the people before us so that you get to, you know, they create a pathway for you when you're trying to make your way up. Yes, really good. That's like, that's like the, the main headline right there. Um, okay. I know you know something like escalating in terms of like depthness. The next one's a little bit deeper, so take your time, please answer it. Um, what does resilience mean to you? Um, resilience, resilient, what does resilience mean to me? Oh, goodness. That's such a small word for such a big meaning. Because the first thing I think is like community-wise, because people outside of the community don't know what happens inside of the community to make sure that the youth thrive, to make sure that the community thrives, which is being resilient, you know, having everybody come together to be one. And a word for that in my language is no mute, and it means to be one. So I don't think anybody's individual. I think we all come together to just be resilient in our own way, but also together so that it's more than it is. Yes. <laughs> so good. So good. I love that. Holy That's it. Question again. You can repeat the question and give me the word. Mm. So great. 
So did anything, when you were speaking to your subject, did anything surprise you or, or speak up to you? I think what surprised me in my interview was mainly the whole thing because it's part of a residential school. You know, I wasn't born, I wasn't there yet. I didn't experience it, but I still feel the impact and the trauma. Um, yeah, he, he'll explain in the interview and the stories and what he experienced, what he went through. I couldn't even imagine that now in 2000. <laughs> like, so last time that was school closed down in 19. I can't even remember. It was 97. 96? 96. Not very long ago. Not very long ago. But I could never imagine how that is now. If we still have residential schools now. Because I, my whole family, all <laughs> billions of us would be in there. I think that's what surprised me the most, was just the whole residential school Sweet, okay, perfect, thank you. Any next yeah. question, we'll move it all on. Mm -hmm. So, how has, maybe just in this situation, or anything more generally with people and resilience, how has COVID-19 made the process of showca showcasing resilience more difficult? I think COVID-19 made it more difficult to showcase resilience because the first thing I think about is my elders, my matriarchs, my, you know, my people, because I live with elders and they're vulnerable. So I think that made it really hard to showcase resilience when, because they're vulnerable, they can't go places, they can't speak at events that they usually speak at, like my Uncle Alex. Because he speaks a lot, he goes on Zoom throughout the day you know, because he can't be there in person. So I really do, yeah, think it COVID nineteen affected that all. Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant, as always. So uh, of the, the the interviews, stories, all that we're doing here with stories of resilience and all what must be just using the video. What do you want to see come out of this? Like, I don't, like, yes, so many kind of things, but, like, what do you want to see? What positive impact, impact do you think our project, or do you want to see it have? What I want to see is, um, that we're not alone. Because there, there's how many of us doing this part? Seven. There's seven, seven of us doing a project, an interview, uh, and it's more than just an interview, you know, it's, it's feeling it and being present in that moment. So, yeah, we're not alone, we're not, we're all working together to make this project happen. I think that's pretty great. <laughs>
give people the tools and the technologies to be able to tell their stories and share their stories with others. Um, as April mentioned earlier, uh, it's really important to put these technologies in the hands of youth because they are the future generation. Um, they have a, a lot of important stories and, and messages to pass on to people. Um, so we uh, helped with some of the technical training for uh, the stories of resilience with the video you saw there. Um, and my coworker Marina um, was involved in a lot of the uh, support there for the youth. And uh, we followed that up with another camp that was mentored by an artist, uh, an indigenous artist named Peruzzo, and that was for two weeks. And he named that um, Our Stories, Our Lens, and that was uh, furthering um, support for some of the young indigenous creators that you saw today and helping them to complete their amazing works. Um, we had the opportunity to um, work with Sid on her film, which I'm sure you'll see later on this afternoon. Um, and we were also able to work with the help and support of Tana Thomas. So we really appreciate working with Tana as well. That's been amazing. Um, so yes, and as April said, uh, we are showing these works in our gallery. Um, we've got a little gallery on Pandora. It's by Oak Bay Junction. The um, ex exhibition is going to be there until the end of September, September 30th. So if you want to see these videos again, um, please drop by and we have them playing on uh, loops on TVs all day. And um, yeah, we, we hope to see you there. And I want to thank again all of the, uh, the young artists who, uh, whose stories we're seeing um, and whose uh, creative expressions we're able to, to share with today. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> you can tell she's the technical coordinator there with the microphone. <laughs> yeah. um, it's my great pleasure to bring up B. Logan, who is um, also part of the cohort for Stories of Resilience. And I was very fortunate to work with her closely on the production of the publication, Talk Long Pacific, which will be coming out in roughly a few weeks. So we can't wait to share that with you and so that you can see some of the poetry, some of the writing that's been produced by the youth as well. So B, would you like to come up and introduce yourself and share? Uh, my name is Bidabin. I come from the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Odawa, and Lenape Nations in southern Ontario. Um, and I'm very proud to say that I've worked closely with the story of resilience um, in their publications. And I'm actually going to read a poem I had written uh, for the publication as well. Um, I'd written this, um, I think, about five years ago actually. Um, I've never had my poetry published before and I've never really read aloud any poetry or written work that I've done, so this is the first. Um, so, uh, miigwech. <clears throat> the title of this is Indigenous Resilience. Your ancestors see you and they bring reminders each day. In the wind, waters, and fires, in the way the eagles hover, and animals play. We know the feeling and we know your days change as you wait for something and someone to say. I know some days are long and tiring and hopeless to you. Others are fleeting, filled with excitement and happiness too. But both are resilient because you choose to keep going through the pain, sorrow and loss. You keep on glowing. We know you feel like giving up some days. We know each time that you pray and pray. We are the reminders for you to try and survive. We are the reminders when your eyes can't stay dry. If all else fails to get you up in the morning, 
let yourself rest, cry, and be in mourning. All the things many of us couldn't do nourish your mind, body, and spirit too. Nourish your hair, hand, and feet. For these are what will keep you and help you when you've reached the feet. And as long as you keep going, we'll be here to cheer. We will stand with you through every triumph and fear. Uh, when I wrote this, um, I had lost my grandma quite a few years prior, and I never really gotten the chance to mourn her. Um, but when I did, it was finally a lot of reminders I was seeing in my day to day. Now, my grandmother's favorite food was, you know, Tim Hortons and favorite apple fritter. <laughs> And so I go, even though I hate those, I really don't like those, but you know, for my grandma, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go have one of these, or I would smell her, her hair. And some days I could swear that I would be wandering around and a gust of air would blow in the wind and I'd be cold and I could hear my grandma saying, oh, baby, come on, let's go, hurry up. Or chicken job, let's go, you know, hurry up, let's get out the door. And throughout my time with Stories of Resilience, um, I noticed that a lot of the youth were struggling with their own things, were struggling with day to day, and I was too. And that's one of the reminders that I kept in my mind was that we still have our ancestors, our grandmothers, our uncles, our aunties, even though we couldn't go to their funerals, because I know a lot of youth had struggled with that. A lot of family members passed away during this time and were not able to gather, were not able to be together. But sharing these thoughts at these moments is definitely what carried us through and definitely what helped us in our communities. Um, and honestly, this has been my home away from home and I'm thankful to be a part of Stories of Resilience and for April through helping me through many tough times and to be able to work with the youth. Um, so, Timmy Gretsch, and hope you guys enjoy the rest of the video that we're going to share in the words. So for those that are here in the house with us, we just want to open the tables so that you can have some nourishment while we're watching the shows. So please feel free to go and grab some of the, the beautiful food that's been laid out. And a special acknowledgement to you, Jessica, for bringing some bannock for us and some jams and some treats. So you know, please make your way when you feel that you're you know, wanting to have nourishment to go and get that. And for those of you at home, that same thing goes. We wish you could have some bannock though. It's pretty amazing. Um, we're going to introduce the next film, and Sid, this is your film, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about it and introduce it. So my film is actually about the revitalization of uh, voyaging in the South Pacific, and my family was lucky enough to sail with Cesario Suarur, who's a grandmaster navigator in the island of Yap. And he's the son of the famous navigator uh, Mao. And yeah, uh, I couldn't done this project without my family. They sent me all their videos and their pictures. And it, it's, just, just, it's just a small video, but please enjoy. Imagine being under the stars in the middle of nowhere. There are no roads and no technology. Seems like it's a bit of a necessary place to be in, a, in this modern society. But this is the place most Pacific Island there where your journeys have traveled. This is the path of many wayfinders that cross in search of new land. called a 
society decided to teach the youth about traditional navigation. The executive director, Antonio, was able to bring Mao's son, Master Navigator Cesario Serrano, into a real summer camp and to teach the youth about the basics of sailing like predicting the weather for the next day based on the color of sunsets and the common stars you for sailing. Specifically as Palauans. Well, to me, it's safe to 
part of our country is doing with the ocean. So sailing has helped me feel the strong waves, feel the wind, see the nights nice that they can see through city lights. And just to enjoy what nature of your body. The Hawaii Finders never ventured as far as they within the Polynesian Triangle, the size of two and a half times as Canada. South Pacific Islanders wouldn't have the abundant knowledge or connectedness that the Wayfinders have, have created. If you sail in a dark ocean with no lights or distractions, would you have the courage? For the navigators have courage as they believe what their ancestors taught them. Um, next, we are introducing Erin Blondo. She is a mother, activist, and citizen of Cowichan Valley Métis Nation, currently living and working on the traditional territory of the Tsupa Asat Nation, also known as Lake Cowichan. She holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology and works as a communications coordinator at Indigenous Climate Action. She is also on the Young Professionals Committee at IMPACTS and is a board director for the West Coast Climate Action Network and a writer for Matriarch Movement. Melanie Blondo was born in 1866 and was a part of the Muscogan Band before giving up her Indian status to be considered a half-breed Indian in the eyes of the law. I can't say for sure how my family felt about being enfranchised, but it is clear now with centuries past that this was another form of assimilation. The Muscogan legacy has been completely lost among my family until I uncovered this part of our family puzzle when doing research for this story. I am the living, breathing reality for many half-breed Indigenous families that went through the process of assimilation. Searching through my family history is like untangling a ball of strings. I can never tell where one strand begins, so I just keep pulling and pulling until some of the string comes loose. Some days I am far too tired, my eyes too strained to make sense of it all, so I put it away for another day. Some nights I stay up all night eagerly untangling every strand. Métis heritage is difficult for some to describe because we are a post-contact Indigenous nation. We are only a few centuries old, and in so many ways our history is just beginning. Melanie, alongside thousands of others of Métis, Inuit, and First Nations peoples, lived through forced assimilation. And like so many other untold Indigenous stories, Melanie's is a story of resilience. She used her artistic gift and talent to change the course of Canadian history. I read in detail about Melanie's story in a book called Writing Aboriginal Women into History by Sherry Farrell Reset. Her story begins in the late 1800s. Although residential school's mission was to destroy native life ways, some indigenous people managed to get jobs teaching at these dark institutions. And sometimes these teachers offered a little more than the typical curriculum, shining a small secret light on the cultures that were being left in the dark. The Capel Indian Residential School ran from 1884 to 1969 in the Brett, Saskatchewan. This institution, like so many others, was filled with abuse and had virtually no budget for education. But miraculously, it did have an arts program, taught by an Indigenous artist. 
That artist was my great auntie Melanie Blondeau. Melanie's work has been quoted in documents in the Department of Indian Affairs as excellent and beautiful, so much so that they wanted to hire her to teach the little Indian girls. Melanie was hired for $20 a month to teach beadworking to Indigenous girls, making Capel Industrial School the only residential school in Canada with a budget for Indian handicraft. Melanie is said to have directly influenced 900 girls throughout the program. She taught girls how to make Indigenous art that was suitable to sell. She set young girls up with skills that celebrated their culture, which helped protect hundreds of Indigenous girls' identities. Although documentation at this time is limited, I can imagine how Melanie would have become a prominent figure in her community, especially because she could teach the students in their own language, and she even knew the families personally. Melanie's students had exhibits in the Regina Exhibition and even won prizes. To think of Indigenous girls being able to proudly showcase their culture in a time when these same items were outlawed across the country is like seeing a flower thrive and grow through hard concrete. Melanie's beadwork was a new phenomenon at the time, being recognized by Cree elders as a distinctive new style. It is said that Melanie's unique flower beadwork and the lessons she passed down influenced the Indigenous beadwork that is seen across Canada to this day. Our next video <clears throat> our next video is by Mary Lagis. Mary Lagis is from Muskogu located in Guayi in Kingcom Inlet in Quagyoth located in Saxis Fort Rupert. Mary has lived in Victoria BC her whole life with her siblings and parents. She is very excited to have the opportunity with Pacific People Partnership and Kenewai cannot wait to gain more knowledge and experience throughout this program. My traditional name is Okulatome and I did it from the uh, second seat of the Gigyotam of the Hafamis tribe. And um, Hafamis is one of the four tribes of the Muskomatsawadino, um, came from Guilford, Hopetown, and Wakeman. And um, the Hafamis come from Wakeman. So that's how I get my traditional name. And um, my English name is Alex Nelson, sometimes it's called Alexander. And, um, and I come from Kinkum Inlet, and I can say also a Guilford Island. And that's where I was brought up between the two villages. We should be like Kesla, while I sleep in a Kanana Knas. We should be like Kesla, and I come to Knas. Guys are from Gatham, Yakatis. Gatham, Jamas Yakno, Knach. And a Pachala, and Dunbe.
There, he's got positions in how I'm used to, but it was uh, uh, Henry Nelson, and um, he, he married my mother. Her name was Kathleen, and she was a lagus, and um, originally she's a willy, and her dad was um, Yachat Nissen. Um, and there was, in the old days, they, they had a big family, so I think mom was the, the second uh, oldest of her. Her, her sisters and brothers, um, and they're from the Klikusut, you know, um, the main bloodlines of the Willie. Today's uh, last name is Willie, Toby Willie. Um, and um, so with that, I, uh, and, and with um, my dad's mom, um, the C2 was uh, from the Muskimak say the biggest achievements when I said uh, I will and I do to my wife when we got married. Uh, but, uh, but overall, um, one of my biggest achievements that I think had come from the sport world, and I know we'll make reference to that later on, about how sport plays a wonderful role in my personal life. But uh, um, I had a chance to uh, lead the 1997 North American Indigenous Games here in Victoria in 1997 and there was a big, big gathering and it required high level organizing skills and tools and uh, understanding about how to um, pay respect to the young athletes and, um, and create a place where it's safe and fun and uh, warm. And so this was in Victoria in August 1997 from August 3rd to the 10th for for one whole week, um, we were responsible for the lives of those young people to ensure that they enjoyed themselves. And um, that was the biggest task that I ever was responsible for personally in many ways, but with a great team of workers and volunteers, it became a really wonderful, successful event. And that we had an opportunity to show the world who we were and show ourselves who we are. I entered um, Alert Bay uh, Residential School called St. Michael's and it was run by the Anglican Church and we know today that um, churches were uh, primary players in, um, involved in these uh, residential schools across Canada and there are uh, maybe four different uh, residential schools on Vancouver Island itself. Of course, Alert Bay is close to our communities, and it became a central place for uh, other students to be sent there. And I know I made 
great strong friends with the, the Haidas, the Tsimshian, the Niskas, the Haisla, you know, those are communities up and down the coast. And it was those students that came also be a part of the residential school experience. Um, so I, it was kind of something where um, we know that it's a traumatic experience now. And at the time, you didn't use that term trauma because you didn't know what it really meant. You just knew that things were happening. And, um, and it wasn't until um, later on in years, they had this um, uh, class action suit, they call it, where the government was sued and they, had, they paid out money for all those that ever went to residential school. And so in preparation for that, um, I started to do a date, written, writing down dates. I says, hmm, if I went to residential school in 1954 um, and I didn't know what year I actually went there, so I said, okay, I graduated in 1965 in Mission, I know that's recorded, and I was born October 31st, 1946. So I started to do the year yearly analysis. And so, and I also knew that I spent the first two years, uh, grade one, grade two, in Kinkham, in our home village. So I must have gone to residence school when I was grade three. And when I said that, yeah, yeah, I remember going there when I was grade three. So by that time I had I analyzed it that I, it was 1954 and 1961 because that's when uh, we got shipped even further away. They called it the Boating Hole Program and we ended up in a place called Mission City in the Fraser Valley. And so we got split up I mean, there again. We know that to be taken away from your home village, taken away from your family, taken away from who you are and not allowed to speak your language uh, was really, really um, I guess now known as a trauma and devastation. When did I realize I wanted to devote my life to soccer? Um, I think it, it's a process thing. Um, and then it becomes what I call passion. I went to University at UVic and I enrolled in leisure studies, sports administration. And one of my um, classmates asked me a question about what is it about soccer that you're so passionate about, Alec? I didn't really have an answer at that time, at that moment. But it prompted me to um, question myself that, which is the question you're asking now. Uh, a seed was planted even when I was born. Because in Kinkum we were very fortunate to have a soccer field built, a nice beautiful soccer field built in 1937-38. And then to go witness um, the spirit that soccer brought to the village was when, uh, and I remember this, that two o'clock in the afternoon after people came from church, uh, at one o'clock somebody would go up and down the village blowing a whistle that told the villagers that there's going to be a game at two o'clock. Thank you because you had the whole tribe there um, circling that field. It became a big forum. Um, and then the game would go on. And I think I captured that spirit. And that's how I analyze it. May, uh, Victoria Day, um, they would have a sports day to celebrate that long weekend. And of course, um, I start remembering how the neighboring villages came to participate in the tournament. And the Alert Bay teams, the Kingcom team, Guilford team, Village Island team, Fort Rupert team, so it became quite tribal, and of course what made it so awesome for us in, by this time we're all, we're in a residential school, so you have relatives coming to play in that tournament, and families, and so you had a chance to be with them and visit them right there. Um, so it created once again this great feeling of community and involvement, just by having your family play that sport. So when a staff person would throw the ball out, say, you kids go play now. Um, so we would go play amongst each other and have a little scrimmage and on and on. Um, 
I started to look back on that experience and I start thinking, hmm, that was the time when uh, freedom was it played a role in our lives. We always searched for that freedom. We were we had that freedom where we, when we were in the village as young kids, and now for this moment where the staff said go and play, that was a freedom, you know. And uh, so, in my mind and my heart, when I start to learn about answer that question that my university. Um, partner asked about what's the passion there? Well, soccer, it symbolizes freedom. It's not just a game for me. It is freedom, you know. Um, so there are influences that happened to come your way and you start to interpret it as to, is that passion? Is that an involvement? And so that's where I really grasped onto that. And it's taken me around the world now, you know, and in my, my field of sports administration, you know, I've been really fortunate to be involved, and right now I'm 74 years old, and I'm still playing this wonderful game, among other, you know, with um, my teammates. Of how Dad was uh, quite an inspiring um, a soccer player, and anyway, he, he has um, his um, younger brother. His name was um, Uncle Pin, Harry Scow. And I remember going, and this, by this time, June sports had come around. In 1958, they created June sports, and it was the celebration of Canada's centenary. So they, um, it became a really big event, and June sports was um, set up um, on Father's Day, and uh, probably the third week in June. And, uh, and it, wasn't, um, it was intended to be timed so when the fishermen were getting ready to go out to um, the fishing grounds, the Gilnet and the Seine, they wanted to use that event to bless uh, the fishermen and the fishing industry, as well as being a sport event. And so I, I you know, I, I can't, how do you say, forget that it wasn't just a sport soccer tournament. Um, they did uh, include, you know, that blessing. Guess who is going up there to receive a Most Valuable Player Award in June Sports? There, I was a young boy and I was looking up as he was going up the steps to go and receive his award. Number nine, my Uncle Pin. And he was 49 years old at the time he received that award. And at that time I said, I want to be like my Uncle Pin. So since then, I was always number nine, and I said, how can I outplay this 49? Well, it has its own time. But for him to go and receive that award in front of the people, it was significant, of course, because he was a gentleman, and, but he was very strong. And when it came to, when the whistle blew, he became a soccer player, a soccer player. I mean, he, he had a strength about him. and. Uh, so I look at that and then I, I, I pair that up with his older brother, my dad. I says, hmm, the world of soccer is strong in our blood. So when I tell my grandchildren, grand, my daughter, says, if you're Nelson, you got no choice, you're playing soccer. <laughs> As a young boy, I, I was seven years old. Brother Frank and I went at the same time, he was eight years old and we'd see this a red brick building and we knew that uh, it was a big school it was called but we didn't know what was going on in there as young boys you just saw it as a picture because we were there to go and um, go to the movies and do other things um, as young boys and anyway um, and so when we finally uh, were told that we were going to go there and this is what, um, there's a couple of layers of emotion that come my way. I didn't realize when I was doing the timeline for that, uh, when I entered the school, I did another timeline that happened later. It was in October of that year, our mom passed away. And so on one hand, there was this residential school and then the passing of mom. And then it was, uh, 
and I always had this feeling, did they allow me to go to our mom's funeral? Because it was in Guilford, not too far away, but still. And so that um, story kind of is detached right now. And uh, so the timeline of September 1954, you had this uh, emotion that started to be there. And, but when we first entered, we looked forward to going. We were like little boys. We're going to go to this big school. We're going to go to this big school. And, um, and I remember Brother Frank and I had these brown little suitcases, you know, cardboard, nice looking little suitcase. And we, you know, we packed them, um, folded things nicely and uh, proud of what was in those suitcases. And so off to St. Mike's we go. But little did we know what was going to happen when you left. So I remember, um, and it's interesting in my story, I used to say mom and dad took us to the big school. But how could mom be involved in it? Because he was in the hospital. In this term called drop off, um, I'll come to that story in a little while, the term dropping off. But anyway, we go in there and um, we get registered. We go meet the the principal or the staff and they take you to a place where you get registered and um, and right there um, after dad gives us his hug and you know nobody really prepares us for that moment it's like these kids they're just excited and we go left and that's going to the boy side and the first place they take us is in the clothing room and um, so dad leaves Frank and I go left, and like I say, just that moment, I don't, like I say, for me, the excitement was still there, but it started to change. First evening, you're sleeping, and you got all these other boys from other places. When I think back on it, that was a, a level of comfort, at least we were together, because what starts to happen is you, now you have your own sleeping space, okay? You have your own... And uh, so you go back to this, where we make a left turn, they take you to the clothing room, and they give you all new clothes. You've got your little be uh, suitcase packed with your clothes, but we never got to see what was in that bag again until we were ready to go for Christmas, if you're lucky, or summer. And, um, and that's when I started realizing um, like you not only had new clothing, they gave you a number. So all the, I was number 23, and uh, so all my clothing had number 23 on it, and that's how we were organized. Now you became a number, and eventually you said, that's who I am, I'm Alec. <laughs> no, you're number 23, you became a number. So those become some, some of those attachments that starts to happen. Um, but the emotional piece starts to veer its head in an evening. Um, so you're, we have a seven o'clock bedtime, and us, by that time we're junior boys. So you start to think, oh geez, mom and dad's gonna come pick me up. Oh, mom and dad's gonna come pick me up. The third night, things start to happen inside. You start to realize, Something's not right here. And um, so, and this happened so often, September's, we learn how to go under our covers and start to cry inside in the whole dormitory. It was eerie to listen to that crying, that silence and crying and silence. And everybody was getting homesick, realizing, where's my mom, where's my dad? It's not gonna happen. Interesting in Kingham, uh, and Guilford, uh, near the end of August, about two weeks into August, you start to realize that you're going to get sent away again. You're going to get dropped off. And just that term, dropped off, when you drop something, it's an accident, and it's going to have a thump to it. And this is what I think sometimes when I hear that term, dropped off, and it's a proper reference. I 
am now comfortable with telling whatever I need to tell about uh, residential school, and it, it has a purpose of letting listeners know the truth of what happened, and, um, and if it's to help others understand what happens to our family dynamics. And I, I illustrate this where the five of us, Nelsons, ended up in St. Mike's together. You had uh, Brother Hank, junior boy, Brother Chicken Pie, uh, intermediate, Brother Hank, Frank, and myself, senior. So we're separated. But we do everything in a regimental way where you have very little opportunity to see each other or meet and talk with each other and be together to develop what they call the bonding, the healthy bonding relationships between families. And our little sister on the other side, sister, she's the youngest of our family. She's on the other side, on the girl side. We hardly ever get to see her, you know. So that was my biggest criticism of this, um, the residence of school experiences, how it took our family apart. First it takes you from your community, and then you're there, and then it starts to take away all those wonderful things that are supposed to happen between brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents and on and on, the family dynamics. I think it was that big experience at that foundation way back when, and it's, it's, it's hard to measure, it's just in us, of this term called you know who you are and where you come from. And how it was uh, experienced way back when, when you were a young baby, who would pick you up, mom, dad, parents, the community, would they would uphold you and hold you. And then you start to experience some of the lifestyles that happen in the village. Everybody shared, everybody had this expression of love and care and talked about it and was it, you know. And um, so it, it, it's not, it, it's, how do you say, it? it's a spirit that was strong enough to be there for you as a young child. And I think that's where I would go. It became this big pillar and it upholds you and whatever came away later on. And there's so many other examples that can add to that, but eventually I boil it down to that foundation. I've credited soccer has been um, a real wonderful spirit that's come my way, the game itself, it, the freedom of it. I take that as a self-competition inside me of uh, I'm the one playing this game and I have to look out for how I play this game and who's playing against me I guess in that sense and be prepared for that from a soccer point of view and the soccer a ball is not just a ball to me it is life it is the most obedient object in this world at that time and how it connects with me is what it's going to do so if I kick a ball and slice it to the left, well, it's going to go and be sliced to the left. If I kick the ball up in the air, it's going to go up in the air. It's the most in, most obedient. So I had to take a look at that and say, hmm, what does this mean? You know, it starts to become more than just a game. It is a lot of disciplines that come into our play in life that it becomes a teaching tool. Many things come my way as illustrations and models and uh, stories. One of which is um, our cedar tree. I think we as the older ones now have an opportunity to tell stories about a history, a proud history, and in this case a term resilience. You know, uh, how do you convey, how can you tell stories that demonstrates that. And then how do you then uh, also demonstrate that and walk your talk about that pride that you have and um, at the same time maintaining all the cultural teachings, the behaviors that come with 
the ancient ways um, and the fortunate uh, moments that we still have to perform those. You can look back as young people and look at that strength and you take what you can and the responsibility is to pause and then look forward and reenact as best you can a history. But you yourself become that future. You yourself are walking your own walk. But at the same time, you're taking a lot of those teachings with you. Walk proudly, walk with your head up, let the people know who you are. Remind yourself you are a good heart. The Rio Dose. That was a fabulous film. Thank you. What a wonderful interview. Such wise words from Alex Nelson, who's, of course, a very accomplished leader here in British Columbia and internationally for his work in athletics and for, um, you know, all of the amazing work he does with youth and in community, and of course, for being a great soccer player. <laughs> um, I, I just want to take a moment to say a few thank yous. We're going to br um, pause briefly from the films and um, have an interlude with Answer. Um, but before they come out, I just want to uh, note that the, the two remaining films are wonderful. They're from Peruzo and Eli, both of which were mentors to the youth in their filmmaking camp. So we look forward. We hope you'll stick around for that. It's only about 10 minutes worth of additional programming after Answer is left. Um, but also want to thank our many partners, which is Songhees Nation, um, and also, also of course, Squimalt Nation, uh, MediaNet, Flux Gallery, and Circle, the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement. In particular, of course, Dr. Jeff Korntassel, and also our good friend Hector, who was so supportive with all of the coordination. And thank you very much to the UVic Tech crew for being here and for helping us get this right. And of course, to you, Marina, thank you for ensuring that all the films were in order and presented um, as, as well at the gallery space. Um, we also have had so many wonderful partners for One Wave this year, and um, you know, but none of this work is, is possible without the support of our, our funders, which are Canadian Heritage, BC Arts Council, the province of BC, um, CRD, and the city of Victoria, and um, our supporters in the community, which are very many, and we're very grateful to all of them. And of course, the team of staff and volunteers, and um, our PPP board members, which we so appreciate, two of which are here today, Muave Va'a, our president, President and Lorna Eastman, our Vice President. Um, so thank you everybody for being here and of course there's more to come but for now I'm going to pass this mic over to Nicole. Is it okay if I read off my phone? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Whatever you're comfortable doing. Okay. okay. So this is like just if I speak loud. Uh, yeah, you'll still want to speak loud because it's not mic'd in here. Um, okay. Yeah, could you do it for me? Yes, absolutely. And then I just pass it off. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I just want to begin by acknowledging the Lekwungen, Esquimalt, and Wasanich territory. Um, I have the privilege of being here with uh, the drum group ANSWER, uh, which st stands for All Nations Strong Women for Education and Reclamation. Um, and we're transitioning to into in, um, including queer and two-spirit people. So. Our acronym is going to change soon, but I don't quite know what it is yet. So I'm not going to introduce that now. Um, so I will introduce myself. Buju, Ni Bano Benesik Indigo Anishinaabe Mong, Mong and Guime, Anishinaabe Irish Ukrainian and Daugaye, Ni Magwetcha Wendam. So my traditional name means Summer Thunderbird, and it comes from the loon, and I received that name from Heidi Stark who is Anishinaabe from Turtle Mountain. Um, 
And so to begin, um, I was asked to speak um, about peace and healing. And a couple of thoughts came to mind as I was reflecting on this topic. What I've come to know, and I'm by no means an expert, is that indigenous laws are intrinsically connected to the land. And one thing I've always wondered about in our laws is the more ruthless part of laws. Um, like for instance, when you're watching a video of like a killer whale tossing a baby seal, <laughs> I always wondered, you know, what do we learn from that? And I spoke to um, a good friend, Christine Sai, who's also Anishinaabe Kwe, and she spoke and thought that, um, and reflected back to me that it meant that we can't escape hardship or suffering or difficult things in life. It also made me reflect on systems that are like the whale tossing the baby seal. Systems of colonialism, patriarchy, ableism, racism, I could go on, that make it very difficult for certain communities or people um, to access healing or peace. And so maybe these parts of nature or laws are also calling us to reflect on the systems of oppression that are in fact not bringing peace, they're not bringing healing, but they just continue to cause more harm. And so when I think of the flip side um, of our laws and of our stories, I think of healing. I think of Anishinaabe stories that show the union, balance, and healing that happens within nature. I think of my partner, Margaret, who is Coast Salish, um, who has been deeply impacted by colonialism, and how nature, um, birds specifically, have shown up for them to bring peace and healing amongst some of their most trying times. And I have permission to talk about that. Margaret allowed me to say that today. Um, and so something I'd like to now do, uh, just to give some space for reflection, um, a chance for us all to just be present together in this space, uh, is sing the Anishinaabe water song. And so, this song says, uh, water, we love you, we thank you, and we respect you.
Tlaquapuak territory, and um, we were told that if we knew any of our language to speak, because the whales would, they would hear us. And so um, my partner was speaking Sisha uh, Shishalem to the whales, and the northern pod showed up. And at first it kind of seemed like maybe they were gonna just swim by and keep going. And then they started breaching. And then three of the matriarchs of the pod turned and came right towards us on the shore. And so I wanted to compose this song to just honor those ancestors and the relatives. And you'll notice that Adam's wearing the wolf and the um, whale mask. And it's just to symbolize the transformation stories that are um, told up and down the coast.
Um, good day, everyone. Um, thank you for having us here today. Uh, my name is Alicia. My traditional name is Echtup Aksup, which means humpback whale woman. Um, I'm part of ANSWER. I've been part of ANSWER for many years. Um, and um, my family is, is Swampy Cree from the Grand Rapids Nation in northern Manitoba. Um, on my mom's side and English on my dad's. And um, ANSWER for me has been transformative um, and a, a place of really, really deep healing. Um, so much so that I did my uh, thesis, my master's thesis, uh, on the connection, um, uh, the connection to culture and the power that that has when we um, walk in the world as healers and helpers. Um, most, more particularly around um, being social workers because I'm a social worker. Um, and so my, my whole piece of work um, and piece of research was on um, connection to culture as a healing modality. Um, and part of that thesis was composing a song. Um, and the song is, is a, an honor song. It's to honor the work of healers and helpers in indigenous communities. Um, part of that work um, was reciprocity and that idea of needing to give back to my community. Um, and so this song is a, is a gift to anybody um, that wants to learn it um, and wants to sing it. Um, so yeah, we will sing it for you. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to learn it um, the first time, but um, we have made a commitment to making sure that we put it on our social media so that um, people can refer back to the song if they want to learn it. Um, there's Cree language in the song. Um, the first Cree word is kiam, which is that sense of um, inner peace uh, that comes from walking gently on the earth. Uh, the second part is kispeiwawasawan, which means he or she defends children. Uh, the third verse is wogodowin, which is kinship care, um, or that idea behind those traditional systems of, of caring for children, um, where aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas uh, stepped up um, to care for um, their relatives and, and the children within the family if, if their parents couldn't. Um, and then the last verse is Gisa Giden, which is you are loved by me. Um, so we're going to sing that for you.
good. Uh, my name Buju, Rebecca and Indigenous Jaganashamo and Manganawa, um, Manganawa Indigo Anishinaabe Mang. Uh, my name is Rebecca Haas, and I am uh, Métis from the historic Métis community in Georgian Bay, uh, descended from Mohawk lineage, and I have Anishinaabe relatives from the Georgian Bay area as well, and I am also mixed European. I was asked to speak a little bit about Eagle because we're going to share an eagle song with you and um, like my sisters and answer reflecting on the theme today of healing and resurgence and the day of peace and I wanted to share a traditional Anishinaabe story there's a story of the eagle and the eagle is a bird that is treasured and honored in many indigenous traditions um, but for me, the eagle holds courage, vision, and great strength. And this story really embodies that teaching. It is said that after the great flood, when man came back and the four-leggeds and the birds, the Kichimanadu, the great mystery or creator, uh, gifted man the great law, which was about kindness. Uh, generosity, sharing, the basis of community so that we could all live together with our two-leggeds, four-leggeds and our winged ones all getting along in peace and harmony. But over time the peace was lost because man became very selfish and hunters began to hunt only for gain and for fame and for notoriety. They stopped caring about feeding their families as the primary reason they hunted and it was a very difficult time. And it was Gitche Manadu who got very angry about this and decided that man maybe shouldn't be here anymore and that he didn't understand how to live in harmony with everything and suggested that maybe it was time to wipe man off the planet. And when Eagle overheard that, Eagle stood up for man and said, I know there are good people who remember this teaching and I'm going to find them. Gitche Manadu said, then you need to find them and show them to me or I'm destroying them. And so for days, Eagle, with its incredible strong wings and its amazing vision, the bird that flies closest to Creator, the highest in the sky, flew and searched for that man, for that family, for those people who remembered the great law. And for days found nothing and was very disheartened, but continually went back out and searched. Finally, as Gitche Manadu's patience is wearing thin, it is the eagle who sees one lone family sitting together outside of their wigwam with smudge, offering prayers, laughing together, singing, sharing as a family and representing that teaching. And as that smoke went up into the sky where eagle could see it, he knew he had found that that great law had not been lost. And he flew directly to Gitche and said, you must spare them, I have found someone. And so, as you can see, we were spared. When I think about that story and I think about what we're talking about today, I think about the incredible teaching for me to remember that when times are dark and times are hard, it can be easy for me to give up and to not want to move forward, to turn away, and I need to remember the eagle who had faith that there were good people, there were people who remembered kindness, generosity, and the law that makes peace. And like the eagle, I too can be strong. I too can have greater vision. And I can continue onward and find those good people. And I have found that in my drum group as well. That chance for healing of community and connection. And we all have communities that we can reach out to and then where we can find those people who are also living by that teaching of kindness and reciprocity that brings us peace. Uh, and so having said that, we will sing the Eagle Song, but I also feel I would be remiss if I didn't invite all of my drum sisters up to introduce themselves and share their names and where they're from. I did not share my traditional names, which I should have. Uh, Manganawa, which is an Anishinaabe word given to me by Métis elder Rene Mishaki, which is big voice. And the other name I carry is Huputh, Hupath. Ah, soup. I'm still working on my new channel and it was a name I received in a traditional naming ceremony in New Channel Potlatch and that means Grandmother Moon. 
Uh, can I invite my sisters to come up and please introduce themselves before we sing? I'll share the microphone. My name is Natalie, and my traditional Nuchalnath name is Chak Aksup, which was also given to me in the potlatch this spring. And I'm Drift Pile Plains Cree from um, northern Alberta. Cree, Abdelasi. Nina Nigmema, Jacques Dalawasi, Katie, and I am Mi'kmaq from the Eastern Woodlands. Thank you. Ajishwa Tansanan, Adam Goche. I'm from the Simon First Nation. I'm a two spirit person, and I'm very grateful to be here today. Bonjour, je m'appelle Francir. My uh, English name is Francir. Uh, my given name uh, at a naming potlatch is Nanu Aks Nani Aksup, and uh, I am Métis in French from the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec. Hello, my name is Donna Mandrick. I am a visitor on the Songhe uh, territories. Uh, my dad was uh, Mohawk and Anishinaabe in French, and my mom was Irish and English. Nicole, do you want to say something about your eagle song, or shall we just sing? Okay. Okay. So. The next song we're going to do is um, the Coast Salish Anthem, and I have permission to sing this song from Victor Underwood, who's from Say Out. Um, so we will do that next, and Jessica, who is uh, New Chalnith from Tashat, will be dancing the Eagle Mask for you tonight.
Thank you so much for joining us for this offering of teachings and songs. It's, um, it's been a long pandemic for ANSWER, <laughs> and uh, we haven't had an opportunity to share teachings with people in a room, or songs, or dances in such a long time, and it's very good medicine for us to share, and I hope that it has been good medicine for you to hear it. Big, amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you so very much. I think probably, are you, do you have one more? I wasn't sure. No, okay. Well, thank you very much, Answer. This was so beautiful, and you just filled this space with your light and with your spirit and really brought hope to us all. And, you know, thank you for your words and for sharing, you know, so much um, uh, from, from your families and from your, your elders and your communities and your own spirit. And, uh, and thank you for being here today. It's been wonderful and add so much. And Jessica, thank you for the amazing bannock today. It was wonderful. And for wearing that amazing, amazing outfit. Um, we're going to turn it over to Sid now. And Sid is going to introduce uh, a little bit about the mentors. And uh, we have two more short films for you. Uh, there's lots more food. So those of you that are able to stick around, we hope you will. Sid, I'll just pass that on to you. Thank you. As Marina and April mentioned, we did have two mentors for the film camp. Um, the first one is Peruzzo. Um, Peruzzo is a Peruzzo Kapoor is a Kafuzo mixed media storyteller. Peruzzo is from Aruguari, Brazil, raised between Uberlandia and Ituitaba, Brazil. Peruzzo grounds his craft of photography and filmmaking in values of responsibility as well as pathway to honor his roots. His work examines the inner con connectivity between identity, land, and well-being. Um, I just want to share a few words that Peruzzo really did help my work. He had this framework of using self-location, which to me was my understanding. Wherever you go in your work, you always have to question your beliefs and your identity and how to put that in your work that makes sense to you and to others. Our last video is by Eli Hurdle. Eli Hurdle is a Cree, Scottish, Brit British, German, multidisciplinary artist. His home community is in Wabasca, Alberta, part of the Big Stone Cree Nation. Eli is a photographer, filmmaker, and storyteller interested in documenting indigenous culture resurgence and revitalization. Thank you. My name is Butch Keenum. I'm hereditary chief for South. When the new here, when the new is where you're at, when the new is where our, our Chieftainship began here. Kunanu is a is a special place, a magical place for us, where magical things happened and a, and a great part of our history occurred. So we always remember that when we come back here. But I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to our land, to our territory. Our elders told us that we were we were put here by the Creator, by Hell. We were put here. And these islands were created from, from our ancestors. Our ancestors were thrown out here and the islands were created and they said you were going out there, you're gonna help your people. And that's how the islands were created. And these were created for us. This was a special place 
we said a special place where the, the fresh water meets the salt water and creates this unique place to create life here. And that's why this territory is so precious to us. So I do welcome you, welcome you to our land, welcome you to Quinnanu, and I hope that each one of you will learn something special here today, learn something special about the land, and have a good experience in Quinnanu here today. I encourage you to find ways to enjoy yourselves and all the different things that you do today. And I really encourage you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much or how little you know of our, uh, of your language and your culture and your rights to this place. All that matters is that you're, you're making these steps. And so you being here today is a, is a really big thing. Uh, it's a really beautiful thing. And we hope that the, the, the Che here, the, the work that we will be doing together, uh, will medicate your um, your Shueliquins, but also just to be here, just to connect you to your inherent birthrights here and make you feel at home and make you feel whole while you're doing it. So the Daphne pull, it doesn't seem like much, but it is a great contribution to Quanta Nistrelecha protecting your relatives of the deep because then you can uncover parts of the medicines that Hale's created in this place. I feel like this is a really poetic gesture of decolonization, like we're physically decolonizing the land by taking, by allowing these native plants to have space to grow, to thrive. So I think it's really important to be doing this work, to be taking out these invasive species, to have these natural native plants to be here because they belong here and they've they've been here forever and we've co-evolved with them so we need them as much as they need us. So as we're removing those those invasive plants and those those negative traits and energy that those carry, it's it's taking away the nutrients and the energy and the prayers and the protection that our ancestors have left here in this earth and they're removing that from our medicines and our relatives in the in the dirt, in the soil, in the those little bugs, those microbes, and all these plants haven't been acknowledged for a really long time. And we're gonna heal the land and we heal ourselves and we heal forward and we heal back. This healing isn't linear, it's non-binary. And we get to heal our ancestors who, who, who took care of this land here. And we also heal for the future, for the future youth and the next generations. Consider every action that you're doing here today uh, is a prayer, and it is uh, it is a part of the teachings that Hales has passed down to us after he created these islands for us. All those teachings were there for a reason. No matter what you did in your life, it's always there for a reason, and that. Eric was saying everything was said in a prayer. No matter what you did, everything was said with a prayer to protect yourselves. Thank you everybody for this really sacred work. What a beautiful way to end our journey tonight, to have this beautiful reflection from Eli Hurdle, um, showcasing such an important project that um, showcases resurgence and community action and taking back the land in, in good ways. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today, all those that are here in person, all of those that are here with us virtually. 
I want to thank everybody that helped contribute to this program, whether you helped to create a film, you helped mentor someone that created a film, that you, or you offered a beautiful prayer, or helped behind the scenes with innumerable kind of details. I just want to say this work doesn't happen without community, and we're really honored that um, we could do this day with you today and mark International Day of Peace and the hope and promise we have for our future, especially through our youth. Um, Dr. Jeff Korntassel, would you like to say a word in closing? We've been talking for quite a while and it's been such an amazing time together. So I'm still getting used to seeing people in person. So that's a blessing as well. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say wado haichka to everyone who contributed to tonight to make, make it such a success. And uh, Cherokees, we have a notion of leadership, uh, a model leadership that was shared with me by the late Benny Smith, who's a Cherokee elder. And so that leadership starts with a vision and you have to live that vision each day. And then you make that vision relatable to other people. And then you mobilize for change. And so I see that in all the films uh, tonight, uh, that vision for leadership and that willingness to take action for change. So, uh, so wado haichka for everything tonight. And uh, we always say, uh, uh, until our paths cross again. <laughs>